In this video we're going to take a look at the first pwn challenge from the Integrity CTF that was running for the past 24 hours. I decided to focus on one category this time around because we didn't have much time for the competition. And I got 4 out of 5 so I'll try to make a video for each one of these challenges. I won't necessarily do them in the order of the number of solves because I actually think some with the less amount of solves were easier or at least will be shorter videos to make anyway. So we'll start off with Easy Register. We were given a server to connect to. so. We download a binary, we'll try and get things working locally, and then we'll connect to the remote server and see if we can exploit it there. So if you're following along with the Pwn series that I'm doing at the moment, you'll know the first thing we want to check whenever we download a binary is the file type. So we'll see immediately it's 64-bit executable. It's not stripped, so we're going to be able to see function names, we'll have access to debugging symbols and stuff. And it's got Pi enabled, which means each time the binary loads, it'll have a different base address so we won't necessarily have the addresses of all the functions and things like that. We also want to run checksec as well to see what protections we have enabled and we'll see here that we've got no canaries so if there's a buffer overflow we won't need to worry about tripping off any canaries on the stack. If you stick around for the bird challenge we'll see how we can bypass this protection. NX is disabled which means if we're able to inject code onto the stack it will be executable. If this was enabled then we wouldn't be able to just inject shellcode and expect it to execute. We need to look into doing ROP chains and things like that. And Pi is enabled, which we just saw as well. So if we have a look, actually, let me open up GDB Pwn Debug Easy Register. Let's have a look. Info Functions. And we'll see here, rather than actually having addresses, we've just got an offset to the function. So these offsets will be the same, but the base address will change. So once this base address here populates, all these are going to have different addresses. In fact, what we can do, let's say break main, let's run the program, and then let's have a look at that again. We're going to get a lot more functions showing up now. In fact, let me instead, let's uh, disassemble main. So you see, rather than just the offset at the end with a load of zeros, we've now got the base address for the binary, all these fives. So before we run the binary, let's open this in Girdra. I'm going to use a Girdra auto script and set it to create a project in a temp directory. Pass in the binary. And it's basically going to create a project. It'll import the binary and do all the analysis checks. This saves a little bit of time clicking buttons and looking for files. So we didn't necessarily need to open Girdra. You can access all these different program sections and functions and stuff in GDB, Pwn Debug that we were just using. And you can see the offsets to functions and addresses and stuff like that. The nice thing about Girdra is we've got this graphical user interface and we have a decompiled code window on the right. So this gives you a close representation of what the original C code would have looked like before it was compiled into this, well, into machine code, but here's our assembly code which we would have seen in GDB. And we start off at our main function, see what we've got. We've got a banner, which is just printing out some text on the screen, just printing out a banner, as it says. We've got easy register, and that's it. There's nothing else to the program. So we can see that it's printing out some output. It's asking for a name, and then it's going to read a name into this buffer here. Let's rename that to buffer. So you can just type L or right click and rename. Set that to buffer, and we've got an 80 byte buffer, but it's reading our input using this dangerous gets call. So we know that if we have a look at the man page for gets, it's going to tell us it's dangerous, tells us not to use it, and you should use fgets instead. It's an inherently dangerous function. And it's inherently dangerous because it's not checking to make sure that the input that's taken from the user is actually going to fit into this buffer. So what that means is if we overflow the 80 bytes in this buffer and continue to overwrite the stack so we can overwrite our saved RBP and eventually the return address to go back to the previous function. So whenever the easy register function was called from main, the return address is placed onto the stack and whenever it gets to the end of the function and hits return, that's the address it's going to return to. And if we overwrite that with an address of our choice, we can redirect the execution of the program. So we need to think about what we're going to redirect it to and we'll do that shortly. Let's also just go and see how else we could identify where the offset is of that return address. So we can identify it manually just by looking at the code or we can use GDB to go and identify it dynamically. So let's go back to GDB and let's first of all, I'm going to delete the breakpoint that we set up 
and let's disassemble easy register. We disassemble that, and what we want to do is just set up a breakpoint at the return and try and see what's going on. So we'll say break star the address to return to it. We can also do easy register plus 108 if you don't want to type in the address. We'll try and run the program, enter in some normal input. So I'm just going to put in crypto and we'll hit that breakpoint. So we've got to the point where it's going to return. And where's it going to return to? It's going to return to main plus 28. So if we have a look at our main function again, remember the program was called right here and the next line that it was going to execute was plus 28. So that's where it's returning to. So what we want to do is try and find out how many bytes do we need to write into the buffer to overwrite that. And a good way to do it is to generate a cyclic pattern. So I'm going to do cyclic 100. We know that the buffer is 80 bytes, so that's around about a good amount of bytes for us to enter. Let's run the program again, paste that in. And this time, whenever we get to the return address, you can see that it's actually not going to return to main because we've got these hex values in here and you can actually see in the RSP we've got WAAAA. -A -A -A. So we can do cyclic dash L, paste those in and look at the offset and we'll see that it's 88 bytes in. So again, we could have identified that manually because we have an 80 byte buffer and we have our saved RBP, which is eight bytes and then we have our return address. So 80 plus eight equals 88. So the question is, where do we want to jump to? There were no interesting functions here. Sometimes you'll have a function called win or hack to something that you want to jump to. And we just overwrite the return address with the address of that function. In this case, we don't. But remember, whenever we ran check sec, let me do it again. It told us that NX was disabled, which means what we could do is inject some shellcode onto the stack and then overwrite the return address with the address of that shellcode and then it'll just start executing that shellcode for us. So luckily we don't even need to work out what the address of that shellcode is, what the address of our buffer is, because if you have a look, let me run the program again, just enter a name. In fact, we don't need to enter in a name. It tells us straight away, initialize attendee listing at, and then we're given the address on the stack. So if we have a look at our code again, easy register, that's right here. So we've got this print F and it's actually printing out as a pointer the buffer location. So essentially we can pass this address and we'll use that in our exploit. Okay that's enough explaining with GDB and Geardra. Let's go and have a look at the Pwn Tools script which I've put together. And just in case you haven't seen any of these videos before, we've got a template here where pretty much nothing changes in this top half of the template. All we do is set the, the program name and then if we are identifying the offset of the instruction pointer, which we just found manually, if we want to do that automatically, we might need to change this function a little bit, but quite often it won't need much changes. Essentially what we're doing there is we are passing in a cyclic pattern, just like we did in GDB, we pass a cyclic pattern of 100 bytes to this function, and this function is going to create the process, it's going to send off those 100 bytes, and then it's going to look at the core dump. So when the program crashes, it's going to look and see what four bytes were in the instruction pointer or the stack pointer at the time of crashing and it's going to return that offset. So in fact, let me, before we even look at the rest of it, let's just run that as it is. You see it runs through, it's sending off our payload, we've got a debug mode on so we can see all the input and output and it comes back and tells us that the offset is at 88. So just like we identified manually in Geardra, and in GDB as well, using the cyclic pattern. We can also do that through Pwn Tools. Okay, let's comment out the rest of this stuff and see what we've got. So at the beginning, we need to just basically read in that banner because obviously we're not interested in that. We wanna grab that stack address, which is leaked. So I've just got some regex here to grab that and convert it into an int or into int 16, so into hex, base 16, should I say. And then we're just gonna print that out. So it's gonna show us what the leaked stack address is and then we're using shellcraft, which you can actually use shellcraft in the terminal as well. Let's have a look. Shellcraft. Oh, okay. Shellcraft dash H. We want to list out the available shell codes. Let's do shellcraft dash L. And then we can go and pick an architecture. Let's have a look at Linux shell. 
and we can also specify a format as well. So you can see here we could print this out in hex as well. Maybe we want to put it straight into our Pwn Tools script. I'm going to select raw because that's going to show us the actual assembly code. We'll say F raw and then I'm going to paste that in. Oh, not raw, sorry. We want it in assembly, A for assembly. And that'll actually show us the assembly code that's required to call bin sh. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're using shellcraft.sh. The reason I don't have to specify whether this is 32-bit or 64-bit is because we have the context set up here for the binary. Quite often you'll see P32 and P64 being used to pack addresses depending on whether you're dealing with a 32-bit or a 64-bit binary. But actually if you have the context set you can just use pack. And then it means if you swap between the 32-bit and a 64-bit binary you won't need to update your code. So that's it. We've also got some here just to make some space for the registers. I think I needed that. I've needed that on quite a few challenges. Sorry, make some room on the stack. So we're popping values off the stack into our into registers. And then we have some nops here. So remember I was saying that we need some padding. So we want to jump to our shell code. The start of our so our stack address is pointing to the beginning of this buffer. So the beginning of this padding. And this padding is just set to no operation instructions. So backslash x90 which essentially is just going to execute, it's going to do nothing, it's just going to keep going and then eventually it'll hit the shell code and then it'll execute our shell. You could have that to set set to cat flag.txt or something as well. And that's about it, let's check it out. We run through that, we get we don't get an end of file at the end which is good, I always dread seeing that so let's try who am I Yep, and we're able to list files and stuff like that, so that's all good. Uh, because we have this debug mode on as well, we can also see what's being sent and received between the servers. You can see the shellcode as it's being generated. So if you wanted a bit less output, you can just go and update your context.log level to info or to warn. And then we should get a lot less output. Okay, while we're at it, let's also have a look at some other things this, this Pwn Tools template can do. So because we've got a GDB mode here and a remote mode as well, let's try GDB first of all. We can set up a GDB script here, so for example, whenever we had that return, let's have a look, easy register return is down here. You can see that we've got 129B is the offset. Remember we don't have the full address because it's going to be different each time. We can't predict that because of the pi being enabled. But you can use something called pi base in GDB. In fact, let me go back. Let's hit control and C. Let's do pi base. And that'll tell you what the base of the binary is. But obviously the program needs to be running before you're able to determine that. You can also use break RVA, which will set up a breakpoint from a certain offset. So in this case, I didn't provide an offset. But let's do that again and provide this as an offset. So you can see that it's created a breakpoint at 129B away from the base. So we can go and do the same thing in our Pwn Tool script. So let's go and update our script. And then I'm simply going to run the binary again, but this time we'll put in GDB in capital letters at the end. So let's run this GDB. We run through that and it should set up a breakpoint. Now the only thing is, I think it's going to set up a breakpoint because we are... I think because we did the, we found the offset automatically, it's probably set up a breakpoint there as well. So let's have a look. Here's our debug window. Okay, no, it's looking all right. So we've got our no operation instructions in there. Remember I said that was backslash x90. And here's our nops here. So we've got to our return address. We've overflowed the buffer with the address of the stack. And we can actually have a look at the stack here. Let's do x... Uh, x 32 gx pasting that stack address and we can see that we've got our no operation instructions we have our shell code down here we can actually let's take a copy of that address and do x over 32 s and we can actually have a look and we'll see our bin sh that's part of our shell code in here as well so let's step through it let's hit next we get to our next no operation instruction we can just keep hitting enter to step through those and eventually we're going to get to our shell code. You can see here we're popping the values from the stack into these registers which is something I've had to do on quite a few of these challenges. 
Um, but yeah, this is our shell code in action here now. This is where it's actually spawning the shell. Uh, so that's how we can use GDB with the Pwn tool script. And then because we've got this remote option here, let's go and see. I'm not too sure if this is even still up and running. Let's try it. So we'll take this server IP and port number, the server address. We'll run it again. Instead of GDB this time, I'm going to put remote in capital letters. I'm going to paste in that address and port number. We'll run through that and, yep, it leaked a stack address. We're going to have a look. Who am I? Oh, we can't run who am I. Uh, but we've got a flag, as you can see, so a cat flag. And that's the first challenge solved. So that's going to wrap it up for this one. In the next video, we'll take a look at the search engine challenge, which actually got the least solves out of all the stack challenges, but in my opinion was probably the easiest, if not the second easiest. So I hope you've enjoyed this video anyway. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.